Hi, um, so thanks for inviting me. So I'll be talking about polynomial bounds on parallel repetition for all three player games with binary inputs. And this is based on joint works with Uma Girish, Justin Holmgren, Ron Ross, and Wei Zhang. So at any point during the talk, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. So I'll begin by talking about what multiplayer games are. So in general, we'll talk about K-player games, which I'll denote by G. So such a game has um, uh, K players, which we denote by P1 up till PK. And we'll always use superscripts for the players. And this game also has a verifier. So the game starts by the verifier sampling K questions, which we denote by X1, so on up till XK from a joint distribution mu. And the distribution mu is publicly known to everyone, all the players and the verifier. In the next step, the verifier sends the relevant questions to the K players. So for example, the verifier sends X1 to the first player, X2 to the second player, and so on up till XK to the last player. And based on which the players give back answers. So the first player will reply back with this answer, Y1, which is some deterministic function F1 of X1. The second player will give back some answer Y2, which is F2 of X2, and so on. And in the end, the verifier will evaluate some win condition, which we denote by a predicate V, which is a function of all these questions, X1, so on up till XK, and the answers Y1, so on up till YK. And this V itself is also publicly known prior to the game to all the players and the verifier. And then we define this quantity, which we're interested in, which is called the value of the game. So the value of the game is the maximum winning probability for the players for this game. And here the probability is over the sampling of x1 up till xk from the distribution mu, and the max is over these strategies f1 up till fk that the verifiers can use. And just as a remark, if the verifiers use any public or private randomness in these functions f1 up till xk, we can say that the value of this game cannot improve. And the idea for this is that if there is randomness, the value of the game will be defined as the expectation over that randomness of the value um, based on that particular randomness, and we can just fix the optimal value of randomness that gets the best value, and that can beat the deterministic value. Yeah, it's just because the players know in advance both yeah. new and we. Yeah, exactly. So next, I'll give an example. It is called the anti-correlation game. It was introduced by Feige in 95 in this write-up called Test Your Telepathic Skills, which is a word like this family of magicians, but okay, we'll not go into that. So the game is defined as follows. So the game is a three-player game, and the inputs and outputs to all the players are binary. So the game starts by the verifier sampling X, Y, and Z from the set S, which is the set of all vectors of having with one. So it is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So like with probability one by three, either X, Y, or Z is one, and the other two are set to zero. And then the players are given these X, Y, and Z respectively, and they give back answers A, B, and C. And the win condition is that the two players who get input zero, they must produce different answers. So the idea is that in any of these inputs, two of the players are getting input zero, and the, they must produce different answers. And the answer of the remaining player is ignored. So what is simple to check is that the value of this game is two by three. So first consider the following strategy. Suppose that A is always one, B is always zero, and C is always zero. So then the players are winning on these last two inputs, because like in both of these inputs, the answer of player one differs from the answer of the other player player one is playing with and they lose on this first point. And similarly, if you have any other strategy, F, G, H from zero one to zero one, so some two of F of zero, G of zero, and H of zero must be equal because they are like binary and these are three things just by pigeonhole principle. And so the players who get like two zeros corresponding to the equal bits here. So the players will lose the game in that case. So any questions up till here? Okay, so now, in general, when we have such games which have value less than one, in many applications, it is like important to try to reduce this value two by three. And one natural thing to do is parallel repetition. So what this technically should help us allow to do is allow reduce the value of the game while preserving the number of the rounds. That is just one. So again, we have this K player game G. And next we'll define the n-fold repeated game, which I'll denote by G to the n. Oh, it's just about that uh, since you obviously are skipping this one, uh, Kunal says in many applications, these are all the applications in PCP COM that harness of approximation results, this amplification yeah. is supposed. Yes. So again, in the end for game, we have K players, P1 up till PK, and we have the same verifier. 
But now what the verifier will do, the verifier will sample n copies of these questions independently from this distribution mu. So again, I'll use superscripts to denote the players and subscripts to denote the corresponding repetition. So the players, the verifier will sample x1 i, so on up till xk i, independently for each i. And now the first player is given like x1 for each of the n copies of the game. The second player is given x2 for each of the n copies of the game and so on. Based on which the first player answers y1 for all the copies of the game and so on. And now the win condition is that they must simultaneously win all the n copies of the game. So for example, we'll require that for every i, the predicate v evaluates to one on x1 up till xk and y1 up till yk for coordinate i of the game. And the value of g to the n is just defined as the value of this new game. So one very important point I'd like to mention here is that in the repeated game g to the n, all these y1, up, uh, so all of these y1s, oh no. So in the repeated game, all of these y1s for coordinates 1 to n can simultaneously depend on all of these x1s for coordinates 1 to n. So which is a very important point as we'll also see later. So now a natural question to ask is, what can we say about the value of this repeated game g to the n? So one thing that is easy to see is that the value of g to the n is at least the value of g raised to the power n. And the idea is that in each coordinate, the players will just use the strategy that was giving them value of g. And because everything is independent, they'll just get value of g raised to the power n. And it is also at most value g because to win n copies, you must win at least one copy because like, the definition is that you must simultaneously win all of the n copies. Okay, so this is fine. And the question to ask is that, is it true that these two quantities are equal? And like in the 90s, some papers also said that obviously this is true because everything is independent. But like it just so turns out that this is not true. And there are games where this value of the game g to the n is much larger than the value of the game g raised to the power n. So next we'll also show one example. So we'll consider the parallel repetition of the game we just saw, which is the anti-correlation game. And we'll prove that if you repeat this game three times, you can get the same value as the single copy of the game, which is two by three, which is just amazing, at least the first time you see it. So let me just recall what the game G cube is. So in the game G cube now, the players are getting three bits as input, X, Y, and Z are all three bits long. And for every I, X, Y, Y, Z is distributed uniformly from the set. And now the players output also three bits, A, B, and C. And the win condition is that for every I, the two players with input zero must produce different answers. So the same thing is just played in parallel in three copies. And now I'll define a strategy for each player for three copies of the game. And the strategy is as follows. So every player will just follow the same strategy. And this is the following. So if the input for the game is zero, 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 that is, suppose X is all zeros, <laughs> then the player will output all zeros. Then A will be all zeros. And in any other case, the players will output all ones. So this is just a basic strategy. And now I say that if exactly one of the players gets input zero, 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 then the players will win. And the idea is the following. So suppose that the first player gets all zeros. Then the output of the first player is zero, zero, zero. And suppose that the first player is the only one who gets all zeros. Then the output of the other two players is one, one, one. And now, because the first player gets input 0, 0, 0, just by this win predicate, the first player is playing all the games with some other player. And so like this anti-correlation condition is just satisfied because the first player will output 0 and the other player will output 1. And this is like just a simple probability calculation. You can do it. That the probability of this event that exactly one player gets input 0, 0, 0 just turns out to be 2 by 3. So any questions up till here? happens if you do it twice instead of three times? So if you do it twice, just because you can win three copies with probability two by three, you can win it twice also with probability two by three. So like morally, the idea is that when you're playing three copies, you're playing two copies inside it. And like, you can do like a randomized strategy based on just sampling the third copy. Because you know mu. Okay. Um, I have a dumb question, I guess, but. You can consider the online version where like y i can depend on x1 up to x i, but not on x i plus one. Yeah. And then then is it like easy to say that you cannot? Yes, yeah, so that is just what is called sequential repetition. 
So there, like essentially the idea is that if you just condition on everything up till coordinate IA, in coordinate IA, like you have exactly this copy of the game. It's just like fixing randomness or something. So just suppose you have conditioned on everything up till now, up till coordinate IA, suppose then by inductively you can prove that the value is value to the I minus one, then it's just the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like in coordinate IA, you're getting independent questions. And suppose you could do better, then the players could just fix this randomness yeah. in the initial game also. Yeah, I just made it to, okay. Cool. Okay. That was, that was more or less the arguments why people thought of saying parallel, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, how can it have to look at the other one? But also here, like if you don't see everything immediately, is that, and I missed your question? So like, so here you say, if input is zero, 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 then output. Yes. So but if you need to give your answer after you see your first zero, then yeah, it is yeah. really. Yeah, then you do get two by three cubed. Okay. Like if you yeah. do want this at every point. This is a, this is a row, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the other case, it's up. So this is like the main point that like the answer for the first coordinate also depends on the question for the third coordinate. Sure. Yeah, which is, and. So just as a remark, so this also implies that if you repeat this game n times, you also can get value two by three raised to the n over three, which is just by saying you take n coordinates, you divide it in groups of three, and you just do this strategy on every group. So this already gives an example of like this inequality I said earlier, that the value for n times repetition is much larger than just the naive value. Okay, so next we'll talk about what is known about parallel repetition. So suppose we have a game G such that the value of the game G is less than one. For that game, I'm curious, do you know if that's tight or is it? Yeah, yeah so I'll talk about it in oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So I'll just say we do not know whether this exact thing is tight, but I'll talk about what is not. Okay. So suppose we have any game G and now the question is, what can we say about the value of G to the end? So if the value of G was one, we don't care about this because this is again one. So for two player games, Ranra has proved in the 90s that if the value of the game G is less than one, then what you have is that the value of G to the N at least goes down exponentially in N. And this is itself a very strong theorem based on what we just saw. And this also suffices for many of the applications. <laughs> so the case for multiplayer games is like much less known. And essentially the best known result for general K player games is the following. So it was proven by Verbitsky in 96 that if the value of the game G is less than one, then the value of G to the N goes to zero as N tends to infinity. And the bounds here of going to zero turns out to be something like one over alpha of N, where alpha denotes an inverse Ackermann function. And this comes from the use of density Hill's J theorem and like additive combinatorics. And essentially this bound is, as you can see, much worse compared to like two to the minus omega of N, which we would hope for. So Dinur, Harsha, Venkat, and UN, did prove exponential decay for a large class of multiplayer games, which they called connected games. And we'll see what connected games means later. But at least for some cases, we do have some exponential decay. And I also mentioned just one more result here because it will be useful to compare to our results later, is that Holmgren and Yang in 2019 proved that if you have no signaling strategies, and I'll just say in two seconds what these mean, then the value of the n-fold repeated anti-correlation game is two by three for every n. So they showed that under these special kinds of no signaling strategies, the value does not decay at all, no matter how you increase n. And I won't say much about what no signaling strategies are, but all I'll say is that what no signaling strategies try to capture is the following. That like the answer distributions are such that, that they do not imply that any communication happened between the players. And also like, People also study quantum strategies in the case of parallel repetition, and these are like a superset of those. So it's like nice to study these strategies as well. But I won't say much more about these. Well, you can say that for two players, there is an exponential strategy. Yes. <laughs> Even with no signaling yeah. strategies. And this is the, I yes. guess, uh, what's what all meant by. Yeah. Okay. So next, I'll just mention some of the applications of parallel repetition. So parallel repetition has been used in like many areas in theoretical computer science and math and physics. And I'll just mention a few of those. So for example, for two player games, we know applications in PCPs and hardness of approximation in like geometry of forms and tiling the space in quantum information in communication complexity. 
and at least at some point we even thought that this would this is like a viable approach to show an equivalence between gap max cut and the unique games conjecture but that was disproven by raz in like 2011 and like multiplayer games also have some applications for example in joint work with ran we show that a strong enough parallel repetition theorem for a class of multiplayer games would imply super linear lower bounds for turing machines that can take advice and these are lower bounds we do not know yet and also there is a general intuition that techniques that we use in parallel repetition for multiplayer games can also be used to prove direct sum and product theorems in number on forehead communication complexity and these are further related to proving circuit lower bounds so i won't go much into much more into this but this is all i have to say in terms of applications okay so next i'll talk about our main results so we proved the following main three theorems so the first theorem is the following so we prove for any game g that is a three player game with the restriction that the questions for all the players are binary that is like suppose like in the anti correlation game each player got zero or one as an <laughs> but like with arbitrary length answers so the answers do not have to be binary as in the anti correlation game such that the value of g is less than 1 then we prove that the value of the game goes down as n to the minus c where n is the number of repetitions for some constant c and already just note that this is like a very vast improvement over one over inverse ackerman so the second theorem that we prove which is just a strengthening of the above theorem for the case of the anti correlation game for the anti correlation game we prove that the value of the n fold repetition goes down exponentially in n and i'll just say to the previous question that before our work we did not even know for the anti correlation game whether the value is better than 1 over inverse ackerman and the third theorem deals with the class of games which we call player wise connected and i'll get to it later what these are but these are like a very large class of games that are very general so once we have this player wise connected property we can we are able to prove for k player games with arbitrary inputs and outputs that the value of the games goes down polynomially in n that is the value of g to the n is at most n to the minus c okay so in the in the first theorem it's not the alphabet that's binary it's the number of variables that's uh, two no so in the first it is not the answer alphabet but the input alphabet so like there are three players the first player is getting x as input the second y and the third z so these x y and z are binary here but like the answers a b and c they give they can be from like any arbitrary logs but like the constant here will depend on that like size of the answer length the uh there was perhaps the result of the polynomial bound Are they relevant? How are they relevant to the application for Turing machine lower bound? You, you, you can assume for the Turing machine lower bound that the, this is the playwise connection. Yeah. So for the Turing machine lower bound, we need a very strong kind of parallel repetition theorem. So I have like two slides on it. If you have time at the end, I will say more about it. But like essentially, like these kind of bounds do not work there, and I will say why. Okay. So next, I'll just talk about how we go along proving these theorems, at least in some rough idea. So, for example, suppose we just want to prove the first theorem for now, and I'll say like how we go about proving it. I'll be and we'll reach the second and third theorem along the way. So now we want to prove for three-player games with binary questions and arbitrary answers that we have like this polynomial decay in the value of parallel repetition. Okay, so we'll start with three-player games G, and again with these conditions. And suppose that S is a support of the input distribution. So now note that S is a subset of zero and Q because we assume that each player gets binary questions. So the first step is to observe that to prove parallel repetition theorems, we only need to consider the uniform distribution over the support S. And the idea for this is the following. So suppose we this game G had some distribution mu over the support S. Now for some small constant epsilon, epsilon times the uniform distribution is hidden inside this distribution mu. And now like just sampling any one point from S is the same as with epsilon probability sampling something from mu, and with one minus epsilon probability sampling something from some other distribution. And so when you are playing like n copies of mu. essentially you are playing like epsilon n copies of this uniform distribution and so any bounds you get on the uniform distribution up to just a linear loss with this epsilon 
you are fine with like you get bound for the distribution mu as well so i hope this makes sense and so now we only need to care about the uniform distribution okay so now we have seen that we only need to care about the support of the distribution and at least we will see one result which helps us reduce the number of supports we want to look at by a lot and this is this result by dinur harsha venkat and you and on connected games i talked about earlier so i'll go into the details of this now so suppose you have any k player game g with question sets x1 up till xk for the k players and suppose s subset of x is the support of the query distribution so now we define this k minus 1 connection graph h sub s for the game as follows so the vertex set of this connection graph is the support s and we add an edge between two questions in s if they differ in the question to exactly one of the two one of the k players so here we require that like k minus one of the players have the same question and the kth player has a different question so we'll mostly be interested only in three player games over binary inputs and the idea is that there then this is exactly the induced subgraph of the hypercube on the vertex set s so just as an example suppose we have the anti correlation game where s was this set 100 010 -0 and 001 is just these three isolated points with no edge between them and as another example suppose now we just add 000 to this support and now it becomes a nice connected graph so the theorem by dinur harsha venkat and un is the following so suppose you have any k player game that is connected and by connected we mean that this graph that we just constructed is connected then they can prove that there is an exponential decay so i hope the statement of the theorem is clear and to prove this theorem they used two player parallel repetition of uh, techniques of ras and hollenstein but one thing i'd like to mention here that the proof very heavily uses that this graph is connected and suppose you even had cases <laughs> where the graph looks like a very big connected part with just one isolated point it's not clear at all what to do and like we'll see some examples where like our definitions can handle such cases so i hope the oh, so yeah just a quick question so in two player parallel partition then the constant c only depend on the value so not only on the value but also on the answer alphabet length <laughs> but like okay, here at least just because we have say for example so here the c will also depend on like the question sets of the players and other things and for now we will allow that so at least this result and like some of our results also can not get like a strong result that does not depend on the question sets so i hope that answers your question yeah thanks but it is now that the constant even in the two player case has to depend on the answer right? yes but i'm saying here it also depends on the question which it might not in like the two player case and obviously only also on the mass of the smallest atoms yes. that's connect in the thing yes so exactly like as we just saw earlier when we go to the uniform distribution you already lose that epsilon here in the constant so that is exactly yeah. okay so now we come back to analyzing our theorem so we have a three player game over binary questions and arbitrary answers we saw that we only need to consider the case of uniform distribution and now by the above theorem we are already done when the graph we connect is also connected the graph we construct is also connected and by the two player parallel repetition theorem of ran we are also already done when the game g is essentially two player <coughs> what i mean by that i can demonstrate by the following examples suppose you consider this first support that is the set of all x y z where z is always zero so in such a case the third player is essentially not doing anything right and so like in such a case you can just apply the two player parallel repetition techniques or like another case where suppose z is equal to like the negation of x so here also you can just suppose that the first and the third player are just one player and not two different players because both of them know each other each other's input in all the coordinates okay and also we only need to analyze the support up to symmetry among the three players that is x y and z can be interchanged and also like the input 0 1 can be interchanged that is you can like replace x by 1 minus x so what this means is that all these images that essentially look the same if you turn your head 
are the same for the purposes of parallel repetition. So does this make sense? Okay. Yeah, left with the input set of the anti-correlation gap. No, so after we do this, so we do a case analysis and we have like four cases remain and we have four cases. Okay, so in these four cases, first I would like to mention that we have very, very different proofs for each of the four cases and that are also different from the proofs of the two player parallel repetition theorems. In fact, for these four cases, we have six proofs. So for the first case, which is like the same distribution as the anti-correlation game, we have like an exponential bound for anti-correlation game, which is one proof. And then for the general case, we have polynomial decay, which is another proof. For this particular distribution, we have two proofs that give the same result. And for these two also, we have like two different proofs. And like the last case, we'll also see just in a few minutes that this generalizes to what I call like the player-wise connected game. Okay, so next I'll just talk about each of these cases for some time. So we start with this first case, which is the same as the anti-correlation game. So it is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So here we prove the following theorem. So suppose you have a game over this support, but now suppose you also include the condition that the answers A, B, and C are binary. The game is like this. Then we get an exponential decay. And we just note that the anti-correlation game we saw satisfies these conditions, that the support is this, and the answers are also binary. And in fact, for this particular case, the hardest case turns out to be the three-player anti-correlation game. And in the second half of the talk, I'll also show like a full proof for the anti-correlation game today. Oh, the, sorry, just a reminder, does the denominator result also require binary questions? No. So that is for any K-player games. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so and in a follow-up work, we also prove that for any game over this support, now without any restriction on the answer sizes, we get polynomial decay. And like here, we used many, many new techniques. And at least one of them is just using level K inequality is from Boolean Fourier analysis. So this is just one of the things that goes into it, but we use many other things as well. Okay, so this is all I'll say about case one, other than the proof of the anti-correlation game, I'll demonstrate later. Okay, so case two. So case two is the set of all X, Y, Z, such that the XOR of these is equal to one. So this is like a linear subspace over F2, if you think about it. And for this case, like for three player games over this support with value less than one, we can again prove polynomial bound. So this was first proven by Hongden and Raz in 2020, and later we gave a simplified proof for this. And like both the proofs here do exploit that this support is linear and use some kind of Fourier analysis over these. And this does not uh, just a case of linear uh, support. So I think at least this direct proof does not extend to all the linear supports, but at least I think the ideas would be useful. So we haven't like really tried to push it further to all linear supports yet, but I think that is an interesting thing to look at. At least I think that the ideas here are much more general than this particular case. So I'm not sure if it gives all linear games, but I'm sure it would give something more than this. And a very interesting game here is what is called the GHG game. So the GHG game has been widely studied in quantum information. And I'll just define what the game is. So the game is as follows. The players are given inputs X, Y, Z, which are uniformly distributed from these four points. And the players are required to answer back bits A, B, and C, which are now single bits. And the win condition is that the XOR of A, B, and C equals the product of X, Y, and Z. That is on this one, one, one point, we require the player's answers to XOR to one. And on all the other points, we require the player's answers to XOR to zero. And this is also what is called an XOR game because we only care about the XOR of the player's answers. So in, the, in the case of two players, you describe the CS. Yes, there is, uh, exactly. You would like the easiest case for Bell inequality. Yeah. So at least talking about Bell inequality is like, what we can say here is that the classical value of this game is three over four, that the players can only win on three out of these four points. But using quantum entanglement, the players can win on all the four points, which itself like gives an interesting separation between quantum and classical. That like when you repeat this n times, the quantum value is still one, but the classical value goes down as like polynomial in n based on our previous result. And this particular game was also cited as Dinur Harsha Venkat and UN. 
like as follows that we believe that the strong correlations in this distribution represent the hardest instance of the multiplayer parallel repetition problem. So they study games with connected supports and this is like exactly like all four points are isolated from each other. Okay. So any questions up till here? Okay. So next I'll just talk about this case three, which is the following support that we have X, Y, and Z such that Z is equal to X, Y. So this is like these four points that we demonstrate here. So this is essentially the same as saying that the Z is and of X and Y. And for this support also, we are able to prove a polynomial bound. So I will say that the proof here is very interesting and it uses new things, but we currently do not know any applications for this. So we do not know whether this case is like interesting in its own right. So I will not say more about like the proof techniques of this case here, but it would be interesting to find applications for this particular case. And the last case, which I think is like one of the most interesting cases is the following. So we have five points, which are zero, 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 all the points of Hemingway one and this point one, one, one of Hemingway three. So this is like four connected points and one isolated point. So just following like the earlier argument of Dinur, Harsha, Venkat and UN, like this graph is not connected. So this has like a big connected component, but just one isolated vertex spoils all the argument. So for this case, we are able to prove a polynomial decay, but we are able to prove it for something much more general. And I'll describe what that is. So now observe for this particular graph that while this graph is not connected, the projection of this graph onto each player is connected. So what I mean by that is the following. Suppose we only want to consider the first player. So these three are the vertices on which the first player has input zero. And these two are the vertices on which the first player has input one. So I merge all these three vertices into like one single vertex. And I merge all these two vertices into one single vertex. And I just put an edge between them if there was some edge in the initial graph crossing this. So for example, now this would convert into two vertices, one labeled zero, one labeled one, and with an edge. And this is a connected graph because it's just an edge. So and the I this this graph, right? Yeah. So, and now here in this particular case, the projection onto each of the players is exactly the same. It's just two vertices with an edge. So that's what you defined before, the player-wise connected. Object. Yes, so I'll go into this now. So now we extend this general definition of the projection for like arbitrary K player games. So again, suppose we have a K player game with question sets X1 up till XK for the K players and support S for the query distribution. And now I'll define the projection graph onto the jth player as follows. So firstly, the vertex set will just be the questions in XJ, which occur with non-zero probability. So for example, here, they are just zero and one because both occur with non-zero probability. And we'll add an edge between two inputs for the jth player if they have a common completion in like the support. So for example, here we add an input, bit, add an edge between zero and one because they can be completed by the zero, zero input for the other two players. So essentially this is the same as saying that for every X and Y in support, where like the only different in like the JF input, we add an edge between this JF input inside this JF graph. So any questions about this definition? So essentially it's just you take this graph and you project it on each of the players. Uh, if we were not very fast, then it's probably that if you look at any cut, Right, I mean, here you cut along the one direction, right? a cut of the cube, I mean, in each of the dimension, you cross an edge. Yeah, so, so here you, there is an edge, edge, edge in each of these, but so you'll put an edge in the new graph if the cut has an edge. I'm asking whether- You might you... not cross an edge if there's only vertices on one side of the cut. Yeah, yeah. so I'm saying that you add an edge if the cut has an edge. Yeah, so, yeah, so that is you find a new graph. You just look at the cuts and make sure there is an edge in it. Oh, but so what you're saying is asking for this graph to be like a complete graph. No, 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 just no. One edge. Uh, Avi, it could be that all the vertices are on one side of the cut, and then you don't have an edge. That's also fine. Right, I mean. But that's, that's a that dumb case. That's a dumb case. We yeah. removed it before. Yeah, yeah. Case you... No, no, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, I agree. So yeah. 
So that is then the same as saying that this graph is connected for every player. Yes. So now we say that this game is player wise connected if this graph is connected for every J. And what we are able to prove is that for any K player game, now with no restriction on binary inputs and binary outputs or anything, if you have this player wise connected property, then you get a polynomial decay. And just one thing to note is that if the initial graph is connected, then this graph is also player wise. So then each projection is also connected. And like the vice versa is not true. So just if you see this graph, we saw it is player wise connected, but it is not connected. So the paper has many more examples. For example, we have a very nice example about random three CNFs, but I won't go into it. Uh, okay, so next I'll just give a summary of the main results. So we show that for every three player game over binary questions and arbitrary answers, such that value of G is less than one, the value of the n-fold repetition goes down as n to the minus C, where the C is some constant depending only on the base game. The second theorem is particularly for the anti-correlation game. We show that there is an exponential decay when you repeat the game n times. And the third question is the general case of K-player games that are player-wise connected, where we also get a polynomial decay. And this one thing I'll also mention here for the anti-correlation game is that, as I said earlier, that when you use no signaling strategies, the value does not decay at all. So this shows like a very, very strong gap between no signaling strategies and classical strategies for games with value less than one. Okay, so next I'll just talk about the proof for the anti-correlation game. So if there are like any general questions, I can take them now. Do you know whether the polynomial decay is, is uh, correct or? Uh... No. So, I mean, so it is conjectured that the decay is exponential, but I'm not sure. Okay, so next I'll just talk about the proof for the anti-correlation game. So this is just to demonstrate like one proof where we do get tight bounds. And this proof is also very different from two player techniques. So I think it would be nice to see this. So I'll just recall what the anti-correlation game is or other what the n-fold parallel repetition of this game is. So here we have three inputs, X, Y, and Z for the three players, which are all n bits long. And we have this property that for every i, x i y z i is uniform over this set S of Hamming weight one vectors. So for every i, one of these is uniformly set to one and the other two are set to zero. And now the first player based on entire x gives back an answer A, the second player gives an answer B, the third player gives an answer C, which are in zero one to the n. And the win condition is that for every i, the two players who get input zero must produce different answers. That is like A. So if for coordinate i, x i and y are zero, we want A and B i to be different. And we say that these are the two players who are playing the coordinate i, the two players who get like the input zero in coordinate i. And to prove like an upper bound, we just fix strategies f, g, and h for the players that are optimal. Okay. So we fix optimal strategies. And now we define the set E, which is a set of all inputs for the three players, x, y, and z such that the players win on these inputs with the strategies FGH. And now exactly the value of the game G to the N is just the probability of this set E under our distribution and which we also denote by alpha. So also for contradiction, we'll just assume alpha is at least two to the minus epsilon N for some small epsilon. Okay, so next I'll establish some notation. So note that in our game, in each coordinate, the sum of X, Y, and Z is one just how the game is defined. So technically, I'll just talk about inputs for two of the players and I'll say X comma Y is an E. If X comma Y comma one to the N minus X minus Y is an E, where one to the N is the all one vector. Because like in our support, once you fix X and Y, the third player's input is just fixed. So, and I'll interchangeably use both of these like throughout the proof. And I'll also say that if just X is an E, if for some Y and Z, X, Y, Z is an E. That is like X is represented in this winning set. So I hope this makes sense. Okay, so first I'll talk about the proof sketch. 
So we assume that alpha, the winning probability, is at least two to the minus epsilon n for some small epsilon. So the proof will be in four steps. The step one is the following. We'll show that for correlated inputs x x prime, where how they are correlated, I'll define later. We have that the outputs of the first player f of x and f of x prime are almost the same, and this happens with good probability. Almost the same in Hamming. Yes. So it is almost the Hamming weight, but we'll see what this means. But you can think of it as the Hamming weight. So using this, what we'll do is we'll construct a strategy for the players f prime, g prime, and h prime, where now f prime is almost constant. So using this property that f prime is so f is like mostly the same for correlated inputs. We'll get like a global f prime that is almost constant, but only for a small subset of coordinates, which is of size say 0.1 n, such that this strategy f prime g prime h prime wins these 0.1 n coordinates again with exponential probability, two to the minus epsilon prime n, where epsilon prime will also be very small if epsilon is very small. So uh, this f prime will be. Constant meaning it's the same for all the inputs. Yes. All the inputs, right? Yes. Like up to this Hamming weight, approximately. Yeah. And then they are in a small ball. Yes, exactly. And then using this, we'll just get the exact same property, but with f prime exactly constant. So we'll construct strategy f double prime, g double prime, h double prime, with now f double prime exactly constant for all inputs. Again on a small subset. That wins this subset with probability two to the minus epsilon double prime n, where this will again be small. And now we'll just repeat the same argument for the second and third player. So finally, we'll get a constant strategy f tilde g tilde h tilde for all the players. So now all of these will be constant, but maybe on a smaller subset, say 0.001 n, such that it wins these coordinates with probability two to the minus epsilon tilde n. And the idea is that once you have this constant strategy. So constant strategy is surely independent among the coordinates, and for this you have an upper bound of winning probability of two by three to the n over thousand. And now this will just contradict this for small enough epsilon tilde. So one thing I'll say that this is very different from two-player techniques, which uses some embedding kind of approach. Whereas here we have this thing that from local correlations in the winning set we are able to generate a global strategy for the players. So it probably it should be even easier to run this approach for two players, yeah. or unless it is, you use here heavily. That yeah, we use heavily that it is the anti-correlation distribution, and we also use at least heavily the predicate of the anti-correlation. Okay, so any questions about the general proof sketch before I go into each step? Okay. So I guess there is no easy argument. I mean, you can show that f should be equivariant under permutations of the coordinates because if you could, then it, yeah. it would just mean that it's like like you wouldn't need the yeah I, four steps. I'm not sure because you mean that f is a symmetric function. Yes. So. It is not really clear. So suppose we had that f with one on three coordinates, right? And when you're doing it on n coordinates, you do it in three groups of three. So this itself is like not symmetric, but so that means with exponentially small probability, but it's not clear how to convert general strategies into something like that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just there's no argument like take all the different permutations and then it's like okay, so he gave you a yeah. counter example, basically, right? It is said that if you repeat anti-correlation and uh, n time, you can divide it in groups of three and run the two cells strategy for each block of three. You beat the G yeah, yeah. right? And it's not symmetric. Yeah, so maybe you can do something by losing a lot, but it's not really obvious how to do this. Okay, so I'll go to the first step. So where we show that for correlated inputs X and X prime, the outputs are approximately consistent. Okay, so here, first I'll define a random process according to which I'll define what the correlated inputs mean. So what happens in this random process? First, we sample an input y for the second player. And this is from this distribution, which is two by three with probability, sorry, zero with probability two by three, one with probability one by three, and independently in each coordinate. 
and this does the marginal on the second layer for the anti-correlation game. And now we'll sample input X for the first player conditioned on this Y. So if you just look at the anti-correlation game, this is that if Y is one in a coordinate, you set X to zero. And if Y is zero, you set X to be uniformly random, zero or one. And now we'll similarly sample an X prime conditioned on Y, but now it is independent of X. So again, from the same distribution. And just observe that X and Y and X prime comma Y have the exact distribution as the initial anti-correlation game, just by the definition. Okay. So now we define this event called approximate consistency as follows. So we'll say that X and X prime, two inputs for the first player are approximately consistent if the following hold. So we'll only look at coordinates where both X and X prime are zero, firstly, because as we saw in the anti-correlation game, if like my input is one in a coordinate, I really don't care about my answer, right? Because only the answer for the other two players matter. So I'll look at answers, sorry, coordinates i says that x i and x i prime are both zero, but f of x prime and f of x give different answers on that coordinate. So this is, oh sorry, this is somewhat like the Hemingway thing you said, but with this extra condition that you only look at x and x prime where both are zero. And we'll just say that these are, that the number of such coordinates is small. And with small, I'll just say set n epsilon n, where like we assume that the probability of winning is something like two to the minus epsilon n. So this is the definition where we say x and x prime are approximately consistent. And at least one of the main lemmas that we prove is the following. That suppose you sample x, x prime and y from this distribution as above. Then with probability, at least say good probability, which is say alpha square, the following happens that X and X prime are approximately consistent. X wins with Y. That is the same as saying X comma Y is in E and X prime also wins with Y. So I'll just put it again on the- This alpha square will be a trivial uh, about, right? Only for these two conditions, not for the consistency. Ah, of course, yeah. Ah, so you want all of this. this yeah. Part. So at least does the statement make sense? So I'll go into like some proof idea now. So everything up till here is just here. I'm just keeping it so that you can see. And now I'll give like the idea for the proof for this. So first suppose Y, X and X prime sampled from this process are such that the players win on both X, Y and X prime Y. So as Avi just said, this happens with at least alpha square probability just by like a basic cauchy schwartz argument. And the idea is we also want to show that X and X prime are consistent just by losing some factor. So the idea is the following. Suppose you have a coordinate I such that the following is true, that in coordinate I, when you consider the game between X and Y, oh no. So you condition already on the two, on the fact that both are in A. Yes, so I fixed X, X prime and Y, and I've also conditioned on the fact that X comma Y and x prime comma y are in e. And now I want to say, consider the coordinate i such that only the first two players are playing in both x comma y and x prime comma y in coordinate i. So which is the same as saying that x i, x prime i and y i are all zeros. So the idea is that just by the win condition of the game, because the players win on x comma y, I know that the value of f of x and g of y are the opposite in coordinate i. And similarly, I also know that the value of f x prime i and g of i are also opposite. And this already gives me consistency between the value of f of x and f of x prime in coordinate i. So this gives some consistency condition, which is like the main idea. So after this, some extra argument is needed that once you consider a fixed x and x prime, that such y's, like all the y's like this, cover most of the coordinates i in this sense. So if for some X and X prime, you have a single Y that covers a coordinate I, then already you get this consistency in coordinate I. And just by the definition of the random process, you get like many Y's that cover most such I's. So I won't go into this argument, but I hope the idea is here. Is this going to be the only place where you use the fact that this is the actual game, the anti-correlation game, like beyond the, the distribution? Maybe. 
I'm not sure, but I think so. You can use it as a fact that you can talk about pairs instead of triples. Oh, it shows up here. But oh, yeah, yeah, but the predicate. Yeah, but... I think so. But I guess we'll see. But I think mostly this is the place where we use it. Okay. Okay. So now we have this lemma where we said that for x, y, and x primes sampled from this random process, you have that x comma y win, x prime comma y win, and x x prime are consistent with probability at least alpha square by two. Okay. So now I'll just write the same thing in a different way. So firstly, I'll just ignore this condition then that x prime comma y win. And the idea is that still the probability will be at least alpha square by two, right? So I'll just ignore this condition. And this probability, I'll write as some expectation over x prime of the probability of x comma y now conditioned on x prime. So this is just basic probability. And based on this, I can use the probabilistic method and just fix some x prime for which this condition holds. So this would be the center of the ball. Yeah, exactly. So I fix an x prime such that the probability of x comma y conditioned on this x prime where this distribution comes from this random process that x is consistent with x prime, or this should be small x prime. Uh, that x is consistent with x prime and x and y win is again large. Okay, so I have this condition again. This is just what I said. So the first claim is that without loss of generality, I can assume that the x prime is the all zeros vector. And how do we prove this is the following. So before we fixed x prime, the distribution of x prime was this distribution that zero with probability two by three, one with probability one by three in each of the n coordinates, which is the same as the anti-correlation game. And so by Chernoff, we can also assume that when we fixed x prime, that it had many zeros because in expectation it has two n by three zeros. So I'll just assume it had all, it also had n by two zeros. And now the idea is that in the places where x prime was one, I can also fix the values of x and y like randomly from this set. And so then I can just continue my proof on the remaining coordinates, which are again at least n by two. So I lose a factor of half in like the exponent, but I don't care about that. So we'll have to define new strategies and the event E on the remaining coordinates, but that can be done appropriately. So one technical thing to note is that now E can possibly not be all the winning inputs, but only a subset of the winning inputs. But just believe me on this, that the entire proof will work with just this from now. So any questions for this? Okay. Okay, so now we have fixed X prime to be zero to the N for which the following is true. That once you sample X and Y from this random process, condition on X prime being the all zeros vector, X is consistent with zero to the N and also X wins with Y. So instead of alpha square, I'll just make it alpha to the some constant. And this also I'll change to O of epsilon N because we might have changed N, but this is all we need. But now it's uh, honest to go how many distance because you have a distance from yes, zero. Exactly. Vector. Because like x prime, so it's not really having distance again because for x we are only considering coordinates where x is zero. So x prime is always zero now. Distance. But yeah. I mean. So this is counting like the number of coordinates where x is zero, but f of x is not equal to f of zero to the n. Ah, you don't have the yeah. Okay, good. You don't care about the answers. Yeah, the for the other coordinates, you don't care about the answer. But we can assume that whenever your input is one, yeah. you, you have a default yes. thing and then you never have Yes, it. exactly. So it is a humming. Yes. So at this point, it is a humming bit. Correct. Okay. So now what I'll do is just in this previous thing, I want to call this thing inside the bracket here a new event E tilde. So what is E tilde? E tilde is the set of all XYZ says so that X is consistent with zero to the N and intersection with E. And now just observe that E tilde satisfies the following three properties. Firstly, E tilde is a subset of the winning inputs. That is just because it is a subset of E. So for every X in E tilde, X is approximately consistent with zero to the N. That is just by the first part in E tilde. And now the third condition is just writing this thing by saying that X, Y is in E tilde inside. Does this make sense? So it's just that I've called this new thing inside E tilde. And one more thing to note is that now this distribution that X, Y condition on X prime is equal to zero to the N. Okay, 
So now this distribution that x comma y are sampled conditioned on x prime being zero to the n is like independent among all coordinates just by how this random process was defined, and this can be calculated explicitly just by this. So I won't do the calculation, but just believe me that this is the distribution that comes out to be that like for each coordinate x i y i are zero zero with probability one by four, one zero with probability one by four, and zero one with probability half. And the only thing about this D we'll use is that it has full support. So now at least the idea is that we can replace this part with just X and Y being sampled from D. And then we can forget that we ever had this random process. Okay. So this is to say that we have the following properties that we started out with alpha and approximately consistent. Now we have a set E tilde and a distribution D, which is this distribution I just showed, such that the following properties are satisfied. E tilde is a subset of the winning inputs. Every X, is in e tilde, every X in E tilde is, a pro, is approximately consistent with zero to the N. And also once you sample X and Y from this distribution D to the N, then X and Y are in E tilde with at least alpha to the constant probability. Okay. So the last step is the same as saying that this, my strategy FGH wins this game G condition on D with probability at least poly alpha, where what is this game G condition on D? It is the same as the anti-correlation game, where instead of my uniform distribution, I had sampled the inputs from this distribution. And again, recall that the input to the third player is this one minus the input to the first two players. So does this step make sense? It's just exactly this thing. Okay, so now suppose instead of D, I had the uniform distribution here. Then I made some progress, why? Because I again have this winning property, but now I also have this extra property that all X which win are approximately consistent with zero to the N. So it's like, I just started with this property and I'm getting this extra property. Okay, but now we do the same trick as we did before of going to the uniform distribution. We see that like the uniform distribution, one by three, one by three, one by three, like half of this is hidden inside D. So when you're playing N copies of D, you're playing at least N by two copies of the uniform. And just by maybe losing a factor of two in N, you can change D to mu hat. So does this make sense? Okay, so this will finish step two. So now we have the following. So we again have E tilde, which is a subset of winning inputs. All X in E tilde are approximately consistent with zero to the N. And now the probability of X and Y being in E tilde is at least poly alpha, where now X and Y are sampled from this uniform distribution as my initial anti-correlation game. So any questions up till here? Okay. So now what I want to do is, I just want to change this approximately consistent to consistent. And the idea is the following. Have a subset of the coordinates from which it's almost the same. Yeah, but like there is an even simpler argument. So for every x in E tilde, there is at least one strategy in the O epsilon ball around f0 to the n that is as good as f of x. So the idea is that if you consider any point here, we know that on all places where x is zero, f of x only differs from f of zero to the n in only these many coordinates. And in the other coordinates where X is one, we don't care about the output, right? So at least one strategy in this ball is as good as F of X. And now the idea is that the number of strat such strategies is just the summation of N choose K where K goes from zero to O of epsilon N. And this you can bound by like standard, um, um, like binomial sums that this is just two to the O of log one by epsilon times epsilon times N. So this is just the entropy of epsilon comma one minus epsilon. And just using this, we can say that at least one of these strategies wins now with probability at least alpha to the O of one divided by this number. This is like a very weak bound. So this is just like saying, if I had four strategies that one on, such that on every point, at least one of these one, there is at least one of these which wins with probability one by four. So this is just doing this. And because we assume alpha is at least two to the minus epsilon n, you get this bound. So now we even get the property that f is constant. So this makes sense, I guess. 
Okay. So now we know that there is a constant F tilde such that F tilde comma G comma H wins my game G to the N with this probability. And now the argument is simple. I just repeat this argument for players two and three. And finally, I can make all of F, G and H constant. And I'll just get say something like epsilon times log cube one by epsilon if I just recurse this three times. And as I said earlier, now a constant strategy is like independent among the coordinates. And we have a bound of two by three to the n in such a case. And which is just a contradiction for small n of epsilon that like this quantity is at most this. So any questions there? Okay. So I'll just go over the proof sketch again. So what did we do? We started with the assumption that our winning probability is at least two to the minus epsilon n. First, we defined a correlated sampling process for x and x prime. And we showed that if you sample x and x prime from this distribution, then the output f of x and f of x prime agree with good probability. And now, based on this, we kind of fix x prime using some argument, and we are able to construct a strategy for the players where the first players uh, function is approximately constant. So such that on a subset of the coordinates, we again win with probability two to the minus epsilon prime n. So the subset of the coordinates here comes because at like two, three steps, we said that maybe we want to restrict n to n by two. And then we can make this f prime to be exactly constant just by like looking at some good strategy in the ball. And then we just repeat this argument for players two and three. And like, I think that is only where we use the predicate in this whole argument after that. So how did uh, you come up with this uh, first step? I mean, that's uh, you know, really, you, you proved everything. So but yeah. The, yeah, the intuition for generating yeah. this. I think the main intuition is that, so suppose you, like again that, so suppose you consider like two X's that win with common Y's. So then they have like a lot of shared coordinates. Right. Just, you consider to call the so coordinate. suppose you fix a y, yeah. an input for the second player. Now all x that win this with this y, so on all coordinates where both of them have zero, like all such x's must have the same value, right? Just directly by the definition of the anti-correlation game. Yeah. So using this, we can define like this random process that first you fix a y, and then sample two independent x's. So at least in the paper, I think some of the steps we do a little differently, but I feel this is a little simpler. So finally, I'll just say what the main theorems are again. So we show that for three player games over binary questions and arbitrary finite length answers, we get a polynomial decay in parallel repetition. So for the anti-correlation game, as we just saw, we get an exponential decay in parallel repetition. And for arbitrary K player games, if we have like player wise connected property, we get like polynomial decay in parallel repetition. So, uh, thanks. thanks. Questions? So, is, uh, like, is projection label cover either connected or player wise connected? So I think in those cases, like in many times, I think you can introduce extra points and like make it connected forcefully. At least that is what I think. Do you have some kind of simple, nice example of a thing that you don't solve? Like the, like the thing that you are maybe trying to push this to work for everything or? I mean, this anti-correlation mm. was a good example in that direction. So do you have the next version of that? Yeah, I don't actually. <laughs> I think this is like a simple three-player game, but yeah, I'm not sure. So where, where do you lose, uh, where can't you do the exponential bound? Uh, what, what happens if, if it's not, uh, yeah, what is an example? I mean, it's maybe like a master's so, question. I mean, just the, what is a nice example where you cannot prove exponential, you prove only polynomial? Okay, so I'll just say, so suppose, so at least like this is the only case where we have polynomial, sorry, exponential bound other than the connected games. So suppose one place at least, 
so in many of our proofs like at least where we use fourier analysis like in the ghz like the reason at least i think morally we are getting polynomial bounds is like the same when you do additive combinatorics and you get like polynomial bounds using fourier analysis so you but like at least in this particular case in the player wise connected case i do feel there might be some argument to make our bound exponential and so i can just show this thing again so i do feel like just this distribution might be a nice case if you want to extend polynomial bounds to exponential bounds but like in all different proofs like the polynomial bound comes for very different reasons so it's not even clear whether it's like the same thing so we mentioned the arithmetic combinatorics because the last one that i request was some of the rules for example okay uh, i thought you had a few months ago and uh, uh, what what is the relationship between this and you know, you, yeah, we are analysis, so I know that we are analysis is good. Yeah. But what is, uh... So I think like at least for some games, at least for the linear kind of game, like say for GHZ, you can kind of formulate a problem in additive combinatorics. We're like bounds there will give you bounds here. Mm -hmm. But like technically I think proving bounds here is easier. That is like essentially. But like you get different kind of problems there based on the problem you want to even solve. Even when you work in uh, over F2 to the yeah. yeah, even then. It's... Yeah. So like say for the GHZ game in particular, like if you are able to get bounds on F2 to the N for square free sets, that gives bounds for GHZ. So there are also like some kind of converse things, but like if you, so there are things like if you don't care, if you allow arbitrary large answer lengths, not depending on the number of repetitions, then you can also show some kind of converses. But I guess that is mostly not the situation we care about here. More okay. questions? Uh, in the four player anti-correlation game, I guess step one still goes through, right? What fails? So how do you define it? Like two players get zeros and two players get ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Two players get what's the winning condition? Two the ones that get zeros have to. Oh, but in what will you fix? Uh, y or y? And z? Ah, but the inputs are okay. Um, so if I just look at x and what, what do you mean? Well, yeah, here yeah. there are only three of them, and the third is determined by the other two. Yeah, you can like and fix say y and z, and then yeah, independently y sample x and x. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hmm. Okay, doesn't matter. I'm, I, I, I thought maybe step one goes through easily. Yeah, maybe. So I we haven't like really looked at that in particular because like, I'm not sure if like that is very interesting to look at like particularly like in terms of like higher cases, but maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I also have like two slides about this thing I mentioned earlier. If, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you yes. to show it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, so I'll just describe what kind of parallel repetition implies during machine learning bounds. So here the game of interest is the following. So it's like a slightly different setting than the one we just saw, but so you fix some large K, which is the number of players and K has to be say arbitrarily large. And I also fix a function F which takes as input k bits as and also outputs k bits. So you can just think of f as a random function, which makes everything easier. And you also fix k sets, s1 up till sk of 1 to k, each of size k over 100. So you can think of this as like subsets of the input of size k over 100. And the game is as follows. So the verifier first samples a random input for the function, x1 up till xk uniformly. And then player J is given like the restriction of the input on just the set SJ. So essentially each player gets some K over hundred bits of the entire input. And now we require the Jth player to answer back the Jth bit of the output. So essentially we want that F of X equals A1 up till AK. So it's, it's hard when the player doesn't get it. Uh, when, when what he sees is not, does not include the Jth position. Yes, but the function does not even have to map the jth bit to the jth bit. 
Yeah. So it's like someone is seeing only Q over 100 bits of the input and they have to predict some bit of the output. F is known to the player. Yes, F is known to everyone, yes. So suppose F is random, then what you can prove that the value of such a game is two to the minus omega of K. Just by like doing some counting argument. And the conjecture is that when you repeat it n times, the value goes down as two to the minus omega of k times n. So at least here, what I will say is that, say for random f, it is probably not too hard to prove something like two to the minus omega of n. Just because it's that one player has to win all of these things. But here we need very strong bounds of the form two to the minus omega of k times n. But why do we hope for such bounds? Is because we have this special property, which is the following. So suppose you fix the random string for the verifier. That is this x1 up till xk. Then there is a unique correct answer for each of the players, which does not depend on the answer of the other players. So once x1 up till xk is fixed, we know that the first player just has to answer the first bit of f of x1 up till xk. So like as we saw in the anti-correlation game, the players could do like much more just by correlating their answers because like the win condition depended on the answers of the two players that got the same input. But here nothing like that is happening. And the verifier accepts if and only if all the answers are correct. So we call such games independent games and we hope that for such games, maybe it is easier to prove some kind of parallel repetition. Okay, so assuming we have such a parallel repetition theorem, we can prove the following. So suppose the above conjecture is true. And suppose T is any time function, <laughs> such that T of N is super linear in N. That is T grows strictly faster than N. Then we can prove that there exists a function f that satisfies the following properties. So on inputs of x of length n bits, the output is also of length at most n bits. The function f is computable by a deterministic Turing machine, multi-tape, in time t of n. But f is not computable by any multi-tape deterministic Turing machine that even takes advice in linear time. So in particular, firstly, this gives like a bound against non-uniform Turing machines. And it also gives like, at least for linear time, a very strong version of time hierarchy because you can get it essentially for any function, not even with log separation. So what is the whole of K? Is uh, K times N for any, uh, K is the previous, you said you need it for every K. This K is the uh, yeah. factor of Bablina. Yes, so k here, suppose you'll assume, is just some very small growing function with n. Which is a factor by which uh, running. Yes, k. which is exactly what oh, you'll get yeah, in. Yeah. So it's not exactly k, but you'll get some function of k. Yeah. But basically that is the thing. Yeah. So, but like at least for parallel repetition questions, like if you prove it for like a fixed k for all n, then you also get it for smaller n. So, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, great, thanks.